Welcome to Considerate Life. Today we're going to do that reaction video on Zen Buddhism. The reason I chose Zen Buddhism is last time we talked about why I dislike religion. And even though there are different forms of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana, um, Zen Buddhism is the least structured uh, of the kinds of Buddhism. In my books on uh, comparative religions, religious studies, world religions, uh, Zen Buddhism sticks out as the least formal approach to Buddhism. And so um, I found this video, I, it's, um, it's fairly short, it's 14 minutes, and um, the, the cartoon graphics are a little, I mean, it's just a bunch of stick figures and stuff, but from the first 30 or 45 seconds that I've already seen, um, it, it does accurately represent at least what I've, what I've gleaned from the five or six books that I have that cover uh, Buddhism and its various stripes. So we'll, uh, we'll get into it and we'll watch this, uh, reaction, uh, we'll react to this video. And this is a, this is a evangelical Protestant existential Thomist reaction to, uh, Zen Buddhism. All right, so Zen Buddhism is kind of like a stripped down, simpler version of Buddhism. It's focused much more on just the practice of meditation. See, while other forms of Buddhism practice meditation as well, they also have a lot of scripture, rituals, and rules that come along with it. And Zen just throws all that other stuff away, leaving just the meditation part. Other forms of Buddhism focus on gradually accumulating karma through good actions. Of yeah, see, there you go. This is this stripped down version of Buddhism. And so... Uh, this really does address the spirituality. Um, so what I was looking at is a stripped down version of Christianity last time, basically, um, sort of stripping away all of the, um, all the layers of artificial rules and regulations. Zen, it could be considered as a sort of a counterpart, uh, a, an alternative counterpart to this just sort of um, spiritual experientialism as a way to become enlightened. Whereas Zen sees enlightenment as something we already have, we just have to become aware of it or notice it. Bodhidharma, who brought these ideas into China, is quoted describing Zen, or Chan in Chinese, as a direct transmission outside of scripture, not relying on words or letters. The practice of Zen is a process of freeing yourself from compulsory thought. A lot of us have a compulsion to generate concepts from our daily life experience, and we tend to be yanked around by our thoughts. Okay, sorry, this is my first, uh, like I said, I've said in the past that uh, epistemology or the study of human knowing is kind of uh, part of my wheelhouse. And um, I think it's false to say that we have a compulsion to create concepts. See, in, in Thomism, um, the idea that we create the concepts that we then use to understand what things are, this is a, um, this is a kind of conceptualism. Um, but in, in the Thomistic, and, and if you look at back at philosophy 101, I'll, I'll go through this, uh, quickly when I go over the epistemology section, but concepts are create are created in the mind from things, right? There's a, um, there's a, there's a stripe of, I think, uh, I think Aquinas would be, uh, known as a stripe of direct realism, uh, direct in that the, the object of thought is the thing in the world, right? Through all this complicated process of, uh, inner senses and phantasm and, and abstraction, but we don't, I don't think it's fair to say that we have a compulsion to create concepts about things. It's just, I see a number of dogs and I just, I, I abstract this idea dogness that then, uh, David brain says that these just become, um, uh, powers of the mind by which we understand what things are according to their kind. Uh, so I, I just disagree with this, this, uh, compulsion language that, that we, that we're compelled to create concepts. We're not compelled to create concepts just as human knowers. This is what the abstraction process of human thinking is. What happens when you relax your mind and observe it without interfering in its natural process? Okay. Uh, uh, again, when you observe your mind, th this is, this is something that is especially irritating to me again in, in the philosophy of mind and epistemology. And this is why I'll just shorten this up for Aquinas. Um, and for those of you in the know, this is actually an adjudication of the internalism, externalism debate in epistemology. Okay. Set that aside for Aquinas. This is the process. 
children and uh, we'll just go with children. Children don't have an idea of their own mind. They, they come to the world knowing things. And Aquinas will say the proper object of human cognition is sensible reality, right? So this is where human knowing starts. It starts with things. And then what Aquinas says is that as we reflect on how we know things, we come to understand knowing itself. We come to understand what knowledge is by sort of uh, watching ourselves know things, right? And then reflecting on that. And then when he says is that then when we reflect on the knowing process itself, we come to understand mind. Because if mind is immaterial, right? Then we can't observe it directly, right? But what we can do is we can understand mind as a power of knowing, right? It's that aspect of the soul that understands is what Aquinas will say. So we don't see the mind directly. What we see is the effect of the mind, which is knowing, and then the things, which are the objects of knowledge. Okay. This state is known as original mind and is believed to already be present in all people. And it's through the practice of meditation that you can become aware of your original mind. A simple way to start practicing meditation is to try to focus your attention on your breath. Try focusing on the sensations associated with inhalation and exhalation. Notice what it feels like as you inhale. Notice what it feels like as you exhale. Notice the feeling of existential dread you have when you think about how meaningless your existence is and God damn it, I have to go to work and oh. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I actually did this, not, not this, but this meditative thing. But um, a couple years ago, I was remarking on, or I was uh, thinking about the, the difference between sensation and intellection, these, these two basic powers of knowing. And I was, I was at the gym, you know, my mind wanders to philosophy and, um, you know, when I don't have my music cranked up too loud, I was doing cardio and I thought, you know what, uh, th there's this Cartesian bent toward lauding the intellect, mathematics and things like that, and denigrating the senses. But the senses are this other power of knowing by which we come into contact with extra mental reality, things outside of our mind. So for probably less than a minute, but for about a minute, I tried to turn my mind toward all of my sensations, the, the dampness of sweat on my palms, the way the air felt going across my tongue, um, the sweat on my brow, just trying to force my mind to attend to everything that the senses just simply take in unthinkingly. And by the end of a minute of trying to focus on all of the different sensations that my body was, was uh, experiencing, uh, it was exhausting. I'm like, this is why the senses are not intellective, that, that the, the intellect is a different power of knowing because the senses just simply sense things. Um, anyway, so, so this is actually a, a, an, in an interesting take on, on that. Whoops. Kind of let my mind wander there for a minute. No biggie. When your mind wanders and you start thinking of other things, notice that moment and then gently guide your attention back to your breath. And do this over and over and over again. Each time your mind wanders, notice that it was wandering and bring it back to the breath. If it helps, you can- Now, I, I will say this. I, I, think, um, I think there is a real physiological good for breathing exercises. I've done- uh, in the past, I practiced some deep breathing exercises simply as a way of tapping into, it's either the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system, but it, it, it does physiologically calm you down, taking these diaphragmatic breaths. So there is something uh, just genuinely anatomical or physiological about, you know, engaging in sort of this deep breathing type stuff. You can kind of think of it like one rep for an exercise. Each time you notice your attention drifting from the breath and you guide it back, that's one rep. You also don't have to be seated to do this. I would do this all day while working at a busy hotel. Phones would be going off, angry customers are yelling at me at the front desk, all while I'm just continually bringing my attention back to my breath. <laughs> and yeah, I punched a couple of people in the face. Nobody's perfect. But that's a little different than what most would consider Zen meditation. Zen is often described as sit down and do nothing. But a lot of people think, okay, meditation, I gotta clear all the thoughts from my head. So they squint their eyes and they try really hard to empty their mind. Stop. Don't do that. It's not that you should try to force the thoughts out of your head. It's more like sit down and whatever thought pops into your head, just observe it. 
Don't do anything to the thought. Don't try to force it out of your head. Don't try to hold on to the thought. Don't try to manipulate it in any way. But it's not about having no thoughts. It's more about not letting your thoughts carry you away. Now you might be kind of confused as to why there's so much emphasis on letting things go. On now, uh, it just raises a good point, the, the difference between Eastern and Western meditation, because there is a kind of Christian meditation, but we're not, we're not trying to empty our thoughts. We're not even trying to, uh, to observe our thoughts. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying to use our mind, our mind, our imagination, our will, and we're, we're just turning ourselves toward God, right? We're, we have a scripture in mind. We have a hymn in mind. We have some truth about God, his, his, uh, his omnipresence or his faithfulness, something like that. And this is what Paul calls, you know, setting your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So there, there is this sort of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, just, you know, Eastern alternative to that, which is what Zen is. But I, I think there's, I think there's a, a place in Christian, uh, in Christian practice to, to have a meditative, um, prayer life say um and so this is just a uh just a uh i say pagan but uh alternative uh, uh perspective on that uh, not interfering with the processes of your mind well a lot of that has to do with how buddhists see the concept of the self or rather not self See, I was kind of confused when I started reading about the self. I guess it's something I never really thought about. Like, what do you mean, what am I? I'm me. Duh. I have a name. I have skin. I think certain things and have certain beliefs. And yeah, even though I've changed a lot from five years ago, it still kind of feels like there's some core part of me that is carried over throughout time, regardless of how I change or what new beliefs I acquire. So yeah, in, in philosophy, this is called, uh, you know, the, the, you know, persistence of the self. And so, um, what's interesting about things like, uh, you know, a, a video on Zen is it, is it very much brushes up against, uh, philosophical views, you know, philosophy of mind, uh, you know, persistence of the self over time, you know, w because what he says is remember back to my, uh, I think back to my philosophy 101 or my, uh, you know, what is Christian philosophy or my philosophy, something like that. Um, what I said is that good philosophy for me is always some sort of realism. And so you have this experience that from when you're five to when you're 25, there is something that is consistent over time. There is something that is you that persists over time, right? And this is basically what he's expressing. He's, he's expressing this, what, what I called a pre, pre philosophical view that there's something about me. That's the same. Even through all these changes, there's some, there's some continuity of self. Well, let's see what he's gonna say now. So all this stuff is pretty new to me, but I'll try my best to explain. So basically, religions like Christianity and Hinduism believe in souls, some immaterial essence within us. A soul is what makes you you. It's like the core essence of who you are. I guess it also floats up into heaven when you die. I okay, uh, again, this is this this butts up against this um, hylomorphism versus substance dualist view of uh, mind, say. Not necessarily the soul, uh, but, but uh, the mind. Um, so in, in Thomism, we have hylomorphism, which means that, we've talked about this in the, uh, in the Philosophy 101 video, the, the, the rational soul is the, is the form of the body. Um, one power of the soul is mind. Um, there is an immaterial aspect to humanity, but it's, uh, uh, but humanity is a soul body composite. It's not that. So the, the, um, the union between the body and soul is, uh, is substantial. It is a, it is a substantial union. It's not an accidental one. So in something like, um, uh, Cartesian substance dualism, you have a body and you have a soul and the connection between two are more accidental than they are substantial. Um, and which brings up the interaction problem, things like that. So he's not, he's not, he's not far wrong. I mean, a lot of, a lot of Christian philosophers espouse a substance dualism. So, um, yeah, he can be forgiven for, um, for, um, uh, characterizing it that way. But I'm just saying it's not the only position for Christians who view, uh, the human body as having a, both a material and immaterial aspect. 
I don't really know that much about that. But Buddhism sees itself very differently. They don't believe in the idea that you are some unchanging entity or that you have some fundamental core essence to your being. They disregard that idea altogether. This is known as anatta or non-self. But it doesn't mean that you literally don't exist or anything like that. It just means that you are not some permanent entity. You are just a thought or concept created by your mind. You are like a thought or sensation and like all other thoughts or sensations, you are impermanent. You come and you go. But then philosophers start mentioning the word self, which I well, I mean, there's, there's a part of that that's true. I mean, there's a, there's an aspect of contingency that is, um, we haven't always existed. We come into existence and the existence that we have right now passes, passes away, you know, at, at death. So there is a, there is a kind of impermanence, but, um, we'll see where he's going. I guess is different than a soul. I'm not entirely sure. And then, uh, I, I'm just going to use a diagram. Basically, I think some people believe the self is like a thing. The self is responsible for thinking your own thoughts. I guess it's in the middle of your brain. I, I don't know where it would be, honestly. Uh, and so if you have a thought, say you're thinking about tacos, then yourself would be the thing that is producing that thought. But I think Buddhist... Okay. Um, just to help my guy out here. Um... Aquinas has this, this term called supposit. The supposit is a, um, ontological unit, right? It's an ontological unit. It's a, it's a unit of, uh, that bees, right? And so when we say the self, um, what we mean is this, this idea of, uh, sentience or self-awareness. But self-awareness isn't the self. The self is the body-soul composite, which includes sensations and imagination and intellection. There's a, there's, a, there's a whole complexity of the self. So seeing the self and boiling it down to some generic sort of pared down version, th the reason it sounds odd is because it is odd, um, because we're not any one of those things. We're a, we're, a, we're a composition of all of those things simultaneously right and, and irreducible to any one of those don't believe there is some unified singular thing that is responsible for producing thoughts because your thoughts and beliefs are always changing just like everything else in the world so there sorry there is no unified thing of the self because our thoughts are always changing yeah there's no way for there to be a persisting thing within you so instead of there being a self there is just the thoughts and you can have thoughts about being a self, but having thoughts about being a self doesn't mean there actually is a self in the middle of your head producing those thoughts. Think of it like this. There's a space where thoughts and sen So uh, again, th this, this is problematic in terms of causality. So there are thoughts, but there's nothing producing those thoughts. So every thought comes into existence ex nihilo. That doesn't make any sense. That, that, that plays havoc with our entire notion of causality. Because here's the thing. Metaphysical causality requires some cause for some effect. And what Aquinas would say is that your thoughts are an effect of your immaterial mind. The, the power of thinking is a part of our animated being of the rational soul. And it is, uh, it, it is that power that produces this effect. Otherwise, uh, given, the, given the understanding here, is that these thoughts come into existence from nothing. Rather than having a, thing, uh, having a, uh, a concept that says, um, there are things in the world that impinge on the senses, and because I am a, an integrated uh, substance that has two knowing powers, intellect and, and sense, we already talked about the intellect interpenetrating the senses. And so the thoughts are just a, uh, are just a manifestation of one knowing power of the human self as it comes into interact with extra mental objects, which I think is more satisfying than saying thoughts just pop into existence in my mind from nowhere. Sensations pop up. I guess we could call that space consciousness or awareness. As these thoughts pop up, we tend to hold on to bits and pieces of them, slowly building up a concept of me. And we say, yep, 
that's what I am. But Buddhism would say, no, that isn't what you are. Those are just a loose collection of thoughts that you've decided to call you. If anything, you are just the space in which those thoughts pop up. And, and, and actually, this is getting at something very interesting because there is, a, there is a distinction between the thing in the world and my thoughts about the thing, right? So, um, uh, he had a taco on there earlier. So there's a, there's a taco in front of me and it causes the, 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 the taco in front of me is the occasion upon which I have the thought, here's a taco, right? Or I, I, or I love tacos or something like that. Right. But, um, but there is this, uh, what we might call an, uh, a, a gap in being between the thing in the world and the thing in the mind. Right. But. Aquinas accounts for that and because he has this notion of cognitional being. There's a thing in the world and it comes to be in the knower and it not in a physical way. Obviously there's no taco in my brain, but there is a, the thought of a taco in my mind. And this is because of cognitional being. You know how if you feel angry or any type of emotion, it doesn't really make sense to think I am the anger. No, it's more like anger is something that is happening to me. Well, thoughts and sensations of I or me are treated the same way. If you are not the thought of being angry, then you are also not the thought of being a self. But then that gets me wondering. Yeah, see, um, what he's doing is that he's turning, turning the notion of self um, he's, he's turning, unbeknownst to him, he's turning toward cognitional being and saying the cognitional being of self or you doesn't really exist in the world. Of course it doesn't. What exists in the world is you. And then when you reflect on yourself, you're building, you are building up a concept that becomes this, this, um, this notion of you. And the notion of you does have a, a, a distinction in being. Because the, the concept of you isn't, isn't really you, right? It's just this, it's this con which is what people go through in like therapy, right? They have this concept of self and some of those, some of the aspects of those concepts are false and they, and they drive them to do, you know, destructive behavior. So, um, so this isn't completely wrong. It's just not, it's not, it's not very well, uh, uh, um, nuanced, I suppose. What is the thing that is experiencing the thoughts of being a self? Like, wouldn't, is that what the self is? The thing that experiences the thoughts of being a self? I kind of confuse myself at this point. Yeah, that, that reduces to the phenomenology of self-awareness. Uh, again, if, if we're looking at cause and effect, if we have this, if we have this, uh, this experience of self-awareness, that's an effect, right? You go, well, what's the cause? It has to be the self, it's, the self itself, right? That causes this effect of self-awareness. And then we have to say, well, what is the power by which I have self-awareness? It's the mind. I don't really know. What do you think, man? <laughs> My brain just exploded. Now, I'm trying to keep these videos uh, shorter than longer uh, so that they're manageable. So we're going to end here and call this part one. And in the next video, we'll pick up with the rest of the video and the rest of the reaction. And then some commentary by Jacques Maritain, who's a Thomas philosopher, who gives, I think, a bit of a philosophical overview or overlay of, uh, of what's going on in Zen Buddhism, especially in the meditative aspect. Um, so we'll get to part two uh, next time. And then after that, we'll, we'll see.